to God be the glory. I've tried the road of sin and found its prospects all to see. I've proved my Lord and joys abound more than I could believe. You know, I think the devil would love us to think that if we have struggled and gone far away from home, that there's no hope for us, that God wouldn't want us. There's a rich study in the book of Acts about a man, a man who had killed, a man who was responsible for persecution, but a man who God wanted to change. Preacher, you don't know what it is that I've done. If you really knew me, you know where I've been, you know the things that I've said, the things that I've done, you wouldn't even be sharing Jesus with me. Jesus isn't for somebody like me. Jesus is for good people. You know, that's a statement or statements that I've heard before myself and others have too. Sometimes we're convinced that there's just nothing that can be done, that we just can't change. But the good news of the gospel is that change is available to all of us. I think about those who hurt themselves. Luke talks about the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 who went off into the far country and there he just reduced himself and was a sinner against God and against uh, his father. We also think about how people have hurt others with their lives. And the man that we're going to look at today from the book of Acts is a man like that. Hiram, you've met people like that yourself, haven't you? People who just feel like they've gone too far, they've done too much, and that there's no way that God could save them or would even want them. You know, what kind of answer should we give to somebody who's facing that kind of moral or personal dilemma? Sometimes people will acknowledge the power of the blood of Jesus and even see the great changes that coming into contact with Jesus has made in the lives of others. But for themselves, they often feel too far out of reach or they've done too much or too much of something to be saved. And when we come into contact like that with people, with people like that, we should try our best to show them that the blood of Jesus can save anybody who's willing but also point them to people who have been in the very same situation or at least similar and who he's also changed and reformed and restored and say, listen, if he's done it for them, he can also do it for you because many times people think they're the worst, they're the lowest that it gets, but if they can see someone else, it gives them hope. Okay, so with all the characters that are in the book of Acts and all the people whose names are recognizable, who's the person, if you could pick somebody in the book of Acts, who epitomizes that change, that transformation, who would you say? It would have to be the Apostle Paul. Well, Saul of Tarsus, as we first come into contact with him, you think about the preaching that takes place and what the apostles are facing. In the beginning stages of the book, we run into just general persecution. There are the Jewish authorities that are persecuting Peter and John. But then when you get to Acts chapter 7, there's the stoning of Stephen, and we're told that the individuals who stoned Stephen laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now that's interesting, not only that they lay their clothes at his feet, suggesting that he was some type of ruler, he was some type of leader among their camp, but he's a young guy, he's a young man. He's starting out on an early track of life and harsh, what he believed to be faithful Judaism, and in his persecution, Saul was against Jesus, but of course, as we later find out, he changed. That's right. You know, uh, we can get some of his biographical information uh, from places outside of the book of Acts. He kind of lays out his pedigree in Philippians chapter 3 that he had excelled among his, his fellows and gone beyond them. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was of the strictest sect. He had accomplished all of those uh, things and ways the world would say, man, you're great. But he was also a man who had a lot that he had to to be regretful over that he had to repent of. So when we look at how God changed Saul, um, let's think about pre-Christian Saul. How, how does Saul, or Paul as he becomes, how does Paul look at the pre-Christian Saul of Tarsus? Well, you think about Saul of Tarsus as an individual who was a chief persecutor of the church. He was mm -hmm. present when Stephen was killed, and he was one that was in agreement with the death of Stephen. But not only Stephen, he gets letters from the chief priests so that he might begin to bind. And then the, Luke tells us, put men and women in prison. He didn't discriminate. He, he heard all of them. Later on in the book of Acts, as Paul gives his defense, and as he talks about the things that he did, he says he forced some to blaspheme. Now, I don't know what's involved in him 
forcing individuals to blaspheme and what kind of torture and suffering they would have to undergo in order for that to be the case. But we see a, a man that's on a tirade against Christians and doing everything that he can to get them to go back on their confession of Jesus as the Son of God and turn away, even involving seeing that they were put to death. That's right. Well, he had to live with that for the rest of his life. And you'll find him in the epistles often describing himself in, in various ways. Um, in the resurrection accounts, he would say that he appeared to all these different ones. Uh, and he refers to himself, you remember in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10, how does he how does he talk of himself? He talks about himself as the least of all the apostles and one that was born out of due time and the one unworthy to be called an apostle because of his, the fact that he persecuted the church of God. Galatians 1, 13 and in other places in Galatians 1, he says, I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. And he was now preaching the faith that he once attempted to destroy. Now, he wasn't able to destroy it because God was going to see to the success of his kingdom and his mission, but he was giving it everything that he could in order to do it. In Acts 9 and verse 1, he's breathing out these threatenings and slaughters. It was just his continual life mission to see to it, to make things miserable for those that would follow Jesus Christ. That's what he was all about. That's what he was known for. So much so that even after he's converted in Acts chapter 9, it's hard for Christians to come to grips with it, that he is actually a Christian, and they're sort of keeping him at arm's length, arm's distance. They're afraid to fully embrace him in fellowship until they actually see some fruit of his repentance because he was that much of a terrorizer of the early church. And so we see a man who wasn't just mildly misbehaving and mildly disobedient to Jesus, but that was the makeup of his life. And it's as if God in his omniscience looked down from heaven. Jesus can save, the gospel's going out, but he picked the worst of the worst to say, I want you to see what the blood of Jesus can do. And then I'm gonna use this man to show everybody how I can reform and change people. Yeah, he would say, I'm an example of those who after me would believe. You know, I'm the chief of sinners, but I want you to see. So that's the whole idea that really comes across more with Saul than anybody else in the book of Acts. So if I'm an investigator into uh, this particular subject of how the gospel can change a life, and I look at Saul of Tarsus, who becomes the Apostle Paul, so I, I want to uh, ask and be able to give some answers to that question is how did God change Saul? So if you were to answer that, how would you tell somebody that God changed Saul? The first thing that happens for Saul is that he's introduced to Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 15, he'll say Jesus appeared to him last of all as one born out of due time. In Acts chapter 9 is where we see this initial encounter where Saul's on his way on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians and bind those who call on the name of Jesus. And then Jesus speaks to him out of heaven and says his name twice. It's funny, every time Jesus says somebody's name twice, it's as if they're in trouble. You think about Martha in Luke chapter 10, Martha, Martha, but Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so he calls on Saul. There's this encounter. Saul says, who are you, Lord? Acknowledging that Jesus is a special individual. And then Jesus tells him, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. And Saul was kicking against the ghosts, kicking against the pricks, ultimately hurting himself. He thought he was doing the will of God, but he was working against the very work of God. And then he tells him to go to Damascus and he'll be told more accurately. Right. And, and he thought that he knew Jesus. He, he, he had it all figured out in his mind that Jesus, that Jesus was this troublemaker, this uh, insurrectionist, this rebel who was leading people away from the true God. And with that distorted picture, look at what he was able to do. But when he was truly introduced to Jesus, then it made all the difference in the way his life would go. He had misguided zeal. And he'll say this later about his own countrymen, the Jews, in Romans chapter 9, 1 through 5, and even in Romans 10, 1 through 4, that his heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they would be saved because they had zeal, but they lacked knowledge. They weren't directed properly. But once he was directed properly, he ran with the same speed, the same vigor, but just in the right direction. It's interesting that in 1 Corinthians 15, he says about himself, last of all, the Lord appeared to me, as if to say the way in which Jesus appeared to Saul of Tarsus wouldn't happen for anybody else. No one else would see Jesus in that same way. You think about John seeing Jesus through the revelation in, at the end of the New Testament, but in the way that Paul saw Jesus, nobody else was going to see that. He was the last one to see that. But yet today we still need to be introduced to Jesus if we would change. Sometimes we think we can do this on our own. Some of the most popular books right now are sort of uh, 
self-help books right. and all of these things about reforming yourself and fixing your habits and making up your mind to change. And we try it through New Year's resolutions and just various things we think if we can discipline ourselves hard enough, if we can put our body through enough strenuous activity, we can reform our, ourselves and our lives. But there's something in us that's broken, that needs to be rewired, and only the manufacturer can fix it. Only God can fix it. And that happens as we're introduced to Jesus. And today that happens, not through a face-to-face -face encounter like Saul of Tarsus had, but in a very similar way through the New Testament. That's right. And that's going to give us an accurate picture. Uh, nobody questions Saul's sincerity or uh, his conviction or the belief that he thought that he was right. He's, he could say in Acts 23, 1, that he lived with a clean conscience up to that very day, even though there were moments, there was a time of his life when he was opposed to Christ. And so it's just not a matter of us feeling good about where we are, being introduced to Jesus as he really is. I, I think that's, that's huge. So God changed Saul by introducing him to Jesus. So what else? If I'm looking, I'm an investigator, I'm trying to find the answer to this. Well, how else did God change him? God changes him by introducing him to Jesus. But when Saul wants to know what he has to do, Lord, what will you have me to do? He's then told to go to the street called Straight and there'd be a man named Ananias and he would tell him what he needed to do. So just question real quick, he, he wasn't saved on the road to Damascus? A lot of people think sometimes mistakenly that he was, but Jesus had already put the great commission into place and charged humanity with being human agents with those that would teach other people the gospel. And he wasn't going to circumvent that great commission or his will, even for the apostle Paul or for Saul, who would later become the apostle Paul. And so he sends him to a man, Ananias, and Ananias is the one that teaches him what he has to do in order to be saved. His life has changed when he comes into contact with Ananias. And this is interesting that you read through the book of Acts. And at this point, you're familiar with maybe Peter and John, and you would expect one of those heavy hitters in the church, one of those pillars as they're called, to be somebody who would instruct or be able to handle theologically the, the man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. But God picks this unknown, unnamed man named Ananias in Acts chapter 9, and he has a conversation with him in Acts 9, 11 through 15. Go to Saul, and he's praying, and he's been fasting, and he's a chosen vessel to me, and he's going to bear my name before the chief priests and to the Gentiles, and I'm going to show him all the things he's going to suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias is reluctant at first, but then he goes and it's in that encounter. And Paul never tells his conversion history in the later chapters of the book of Acts without mentioning that interaction that he had with Ananias because that's a part of what ultimately led to his change. That's right. And um, in, in the book of Acts, you have uh, an, another example previous to this that's pointing us in the same direction uh, that's very humbling um, that you have Peter who goes to Cornelius and the Holy Spirit comes on Cornelius and his household to demonstrate the gospels for the Gentiles, not just for the Jews. Um, but it was through the agency of the message preached that he was saved. Acts 11 and verse 14, Peter recounts this and he says it was through the words that was told him that he responded to that and they obeyed the gospel. And that's what happens here, not on the road to Damascus, but in the city God sends and like you say, not some big uh, named guy that everybody knew. Not, not necessarily, so far as we know, somebody who had been sat at Gamaliel's feet. Mm -hmm. But he goes with the simple message of Christ. And this reminds us that we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the knowledge will be, will be of God and not of us, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. And so Ananias is God's agency to change the life of a man who was going to change the world on the other side of that. And you just never know who God's put in our lives to change us. So for Saul of Tarsus, it's Ananias. And the scales fall from his eyes. And Ananias tells him, hey, why do you wait? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And you might imagine a man like Saul of Tarsus in that moment thinking, after all I've done, that's it. That's how the grace of God works. But that's exactly how it works. And he uses Ananias coupled with Saul's faith. And then Saul's sins are washed away. And maybe in our lives, it's a parent or it's a coach or somebody who's a Christian, who's trying, a co-worker or family member who is our Ananias. But God uses His Word and He uses people to teach that message so that our lives might be changed. And we may be somebody's Ananias. And we might think sometimes that we're at a disadvantage because they're smarter than me or they've been to school longer than me or maybe even they're older than me and I can't reach them. But you just never know. Ananias had a lot of excuses, a lot of reasons. It's funny, three times in a row, in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9, and Acts chapter 10, 
Christians have to be told to go. Philip has to be told, go to the chariot. Ananias has to be told, go to Saul. Peter, go to Cornelius. And when they go, great things happen. And so we just never know who we might impact. That's right. You know, um, Saul, if we could interview him today, we would ask him, how did, how did you get to the place where you were to, to take the gospel to the whole world, to be the gospel, the apostle to the Gentiles, to be able to accomplish everything that you can just run down in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 or in Philippians chapter 3? Um, there were people in his life that God used to change him. I think about two people, one on either side of his conversion, and God really changed him through both of them. There's the one that brought him to faith, Ananias, and showed him God's way of salvation. And immediately thereafter, God sent an encourager into his life to help him to grow and, and to be put in a position to be of greater service for him. Because this new Christian comes out of the water, even though he's got a vast knowledge of the Scriptures, he's a new Christian. And uh, Barnabas comes and introduces him to the saints and, and takes him to Jerusalem where they're afraid of him because they know all too well what he's done and is able to, to build confidence in and have him be accepted. It's important for us to realize that none of us make it to heaven alone. We talk about the Apostle Paul, and I think it's good to do, especially in a lesson like this one where we're saying how he was changed. But you mentioned Barnabas and Ananias, and it's important to see that all of the associations that he had throughout his life made him the person he was. And maybe we read the New Testament and we forget that, but he didn't. He talked about Timothy being a servant, unlike anybody else he had ever worked with in Philippians 2.22. And you think about Silas and what he added to Paul's work as they join up in Acts 15 and go throughout the Roman Empire preaching the gospel message and Epaphroditus and all of these people that God used to, yes, Paul influenced them, but they also shaped Paul. They were places when Paul couldn't be there for them. They ran and did different things at churches and carried messages. You think about Epaphras in the book of Colossians and how he was the point man that kind of kept them informed about Paul and Paul informed about them. And so God changed Saul, not only initially through the preaching and teaching of Ananias, but throughout the entire lifetime of Paul as he brought different people into his life and they shored him up and rounded him out and helped him. And I think it helps at the end of his life where he previously didn't want John Mark to go with him on the second missionary journey. At the end of his life, he says he's profitable for the ministry. That's right. And then there's an irony too that Luke gets a special place of honorable mention there at what's likely the very last words of Paul when everybody else is abandoning him. There's Luke who's with him in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 11. Well, there's, there's a progression that we can already see. God changed Saul. Um, what else would you add to that? How else did God change Saul? God changes Saul as he introduces him to Jesus on that road to Damascus and then through the people in his life, especially Ananias in the beginning. But then he installs him as an apostle. And so Paul is in a special situation in which he's the 13th apostle. He's one born out of due time. You have the 11, Judas fell away by transgression. They install Matthias and you have the 12. But then there's Saul of Tarsus who is alone by himself. He's preaching the same gospel, the same message. He eventually goes to Jerusalem and Peter and the others extend to him and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, which is to say we're in agreement with what you're preaching. It's harmonious with what we've received from the Lord as well. He is a genuine apostle. But God installs him as an apostle specifically to the Gentiles. As Peter's primary work was among the Jews, Paul would preach the Jews. But his primary audience was to the Gentile world. And so God changed him by installing him as an apostle. It's interesting to see that God took one of the most nationalistic Jews and put him in Gentile territory. Now, his upbringing, as far as what he would have learned in Tarsus and his familiarity with Jewish culture or with Greek culture would help him. But he's thrown among these Gentiles, uncircumcised individuals, people that had dietary habits that were foreign to him as a Jewish man. And it was his responsibility. And he became very good at it to introduce these individuals to Jesus and show them the way that leads to eternal life. And so his role as an apostle changed him. It did. And it's, it's amazing that God is uh, certainly not going to, to work in such a way that he makes us do something, but God could see all that was going to happen and uh, the good and the bad that was a part of Paul's background is going to open up doors for him to go and, and serve that he might not have, have seen. That, the fact, I look at as Acts 22 and Acts 23, 
where he has the uh, the Roman cohort there who he's speaking to and he's surprised that he can speak to him in Greek. And then he turns around and he speaks to the Jews that are present in the Hebrew language in Acts chapter 23. God saw this, this cosmopolitan guy who was a Roman citizen by birth. And he said, I can use him to go through doors that some others could not. And I can use that zeal that makes up his personality in those ways. Now, we understand Paul could have, we'd have a completely different discussion today if Paul had said, no, I think I'll keep going this way, blind in spiritual sense mm-hmm. as well as physical sense. But you see in Paul's writings that he understood that all of these events had led him to places where God could use him in greater ways. And, and to somebody today who's thinking about fulfilling their purpose and being in a place where they can be where God wants them to be, what encouragement can they find from Paul and how God takes him and uses him as an apostle? Well, you just never know what God's up to, but you know it's something good. You know, Galatians chapter 1, Paul talks about being separated from his mother's womb to do the work that he would eventually do. And I don't think that means that God pre-selected him in a sort of forced way. Like you mentioned a moment ago, he could have rebelled, but it involves that God used everything that made him who he was, his zeal, his passion, his education, his cultural background, his education with Gamelia, all of that in a positive way to make him the apostle to the Gentiles. He's the most qualified one. He has Roman citizenship, like you mentioned. All of those things would play a part. And God can do the same thing and is doing the same thing in our lives. And so God changed Paul by putting him into the apostleship and using him to reach the Gentile world. And God's using things from our lives, and he can if we allow him to, to get the gospel out into the world. If we would submit to him, are introduced to Jesus, and put on his son in baptism, then God can use us in ways we might never have imagined before, but He can do that. Our background, people that others couldn't reach, we might be able to reach talents that others don't possess. God hasn't merely equipped us with those things. Sometimes we mistakenly think it's for our own good and benefit, but whether it's our ability in art or in technology or in video or in organization, all of those things might be good to make a living, but God also wants us to use them in the kingdom, and He can take those things if we would hand them over to Him, and He could do more with it than we ever could. See, seeing our resources, the ability to, to see the circumstances where we are in, in life, the, the, the proclivities or the directions, the bents that make us who we are. And, you know, we, we can be similar in a lot of ways, but there are uniquenesses about all of us. And, and God's not concerned about that. He glories in the fact that he can use different people in different ways. And the book of Acts certainly shows that. And, and Paul is just a, a great central example of this progression, this change that's taking place. There's an immediate change of direction in his conversion, but there's a, this increasing change that's taking place. God's opening doors as he's ready and willing to do that. And you, you'll find this often that God expands and he grows Uh, how he'll use somebody as they show themselves to be faithful stewards of those resources and those opportunities. Probably, I would say, that there's probably more to say about how God changed uh, Saul or Paul in the book of Acts. Can you think of any other ways that God uh, worked through in changing Saul and, and how that looked? This may overlap with something we've already said, but there's a unique aspect to it, and that is he enlisted him as a missionary. Mm -hmm. And so it's not enough that it wasn't just that he became an apostle and he wrote over half of the New Testament and instructed other individuals, but he used him as a missionary. That is, he went into these Gentile places where individuals might have been, like you mentioned a moment ago, thinking, well, my life's been rugged and raggedy. I've lived in sin. I've lived contrary to God. And Paul's a missionary now, and he tells them the good news about Jesus, but he also tells them his story and his encounter with Jesus as if to say, look at what happened to me. You can change as well. You're not too far gone. He was the right man for the job and enlisted him as a missionary. He eventually was saying, as I've been changed, so can you. You haven't gone as far as I've gone. I've persecuted Christians. I stood at the death of preachers. And if God changed me, he can change you. That's right. And, and a lot of these people that he developed and that he helped further down the road were people that he contacted while serving as a missionary. You know, you think about Timothy in Acts chapter 16. That's a guy he meets on the second missionary journey. He becomes a mentor 
to him. He becomes his father in the faith and helps him to, to go to Ephesus ultimately and to preach and encourages him in that work. And, and there's so many individuals along the way that Paul brings in. He ropes in and uh, he, he grows them even as he himself is growing. You know, you see that in the first missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas take off uh, on, the, on the trip and it appears that Barnabas is doing the speaking at the first part of that, but by the time they get to the continent, the Asia Minor ab above that, you, you have uh, now Paul speaking so that when they're in Lystra, they call him Hermes, the messenger of the gods, because he's speaking. God's using him in that mission work to accomplish his will the very one that stood against him before. Yeah, God is showing through Paul that he can change anybody. And that's what Paul says when he lists in 1 Timothy chapter 1, I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and an insolent person, but I obtained mercy because I acted ignorantly and in unbelief. And that grace wasn't just for him. It was to spill over into his ministry and eventually onto his converts. And he was trying to show people that what God did in him, he could do in others. And people need to hear that today. Sometimes people can't forgive themselves. They can't believe that God could not only save them, but use them to reach others. That's right. You don't see in Paul at the end of his life, sitting there wrestling uh, and wringing his hands and saying, I, I just don't know if I'm going to be forgiven. Look at all the things that characterized me before I became a Christian. Second Timothy 4 and verse 8. He says, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me in that day, not me only, but to all them that love His coming and His appearing. He could have confidence, and, and He would give confidence and assurance, and that's good for us. I don't know where you are today. It may be that you find yourself thinking, I've just gone too far, I've done too much. God would not care to save me, that I'm just one that's a throwaway. I, I'm just a cast off. There are no such people in God's eyes. And God in His wisdom shows us an example in the book of Acts of one who had murder on his conscience. But God not only could forgive him, but He could go on to use him in mighty ways. I want you to know that God wants to do that for you too.